Hello and welcome to this very special interview. Joining me today is someone who has been a top law officer of the entire UPA regime over 10 years. First, as the additional Solicitor General, and since early last year, the Solicitor General of India. Mohan Parasaran, one of India's top lawyers. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Parasaran, Thank for you. talking to me. You must be a very tired man, 10 years of defending the government. Ah, yeah, I was tired, but now after the results, <laughs> I've got back my old energy. <laughs> what, what next for you? Are See, you, I'm you... eagerly looking forward to get back into private practice. And uh, I've been with the government for 10 years. It's been an excellent experience working for the government. Because uh, being a law officer for the government, you see how the government works, the intricacies of functioning of the government, what sort of mistakes they make, and see how difficult is it to handle government cases in court, particularly in the Supreme Court. And as a top law officer, you have to face the topmost lawyers of the country. And I feel that you enter into the field play a test match, face fast bowlers, without your basic safeguards like pads, gloves, and other things. You have to bat with all, without all these safeguards, because you don't have essential instructions in many cases, but still you have to survive. And I think it's by sheer miracle, like how the Indian economy has survived, I think we survived over the last 10 years. Can you explain that a bit more? Why do you call it a miracle? Miracle means actually, unlike private lawyers, we used to get briefs in the very last minute. We never used to even get instructions. And uh, the government, in most of the cases I'm talking, not sensitive matters, is very impersonal. And uh, possibly there is a communication gap between several ministries. The concerned administrative machine, a ministry may not be even knowing that a particular matter is coming up for hearing in the Supreme Court on a particular day. And therefore, they would not have given proper instructions. So the court would be expecting some definitive answer from a law officer. We will be having incomplete papers. But with all that, you will have to manage the court. And we are banking overall, they will be having a top lawyer on the other side. So it was so difficult. No? And appearing for the government is like working in a government hospital. You have all sorts of cases, like all sorts of patients. But nevertheless, it was a fantastic experience. Because... Uh, uh, are, are, you, are you signing off? Yes. You'll be... I'll be resigning sh shortly, and today was perhaps my last day, and uh, paradoxically, I'd appeared as a case pertaining to bringing back black the black money into India. I want to talk about uh, a few issues with you, Mr. Yes. Parasaran. Uh, you and I have had a few conversations over the last few years. You've been extremely candid now that you're coming to the end of this journey of yours. I want to talk about a few issues with you. The last 10 years saw a very serious, if I may use that word, disconnect between the executive and the judiciary. Uh, while legal stalwarts have come out and said openly that perhaps we are seeing enhanced judicial activism, uh, we've seen a, some sort of a strain isn't it? Where the judiciary has on many occasions gone into policy space, executive space, and there have been certain acts by the executive which have been seen by the judiciary as saying you're trying to get into our turf. As a very senior lawyer, do, do, do you find this, and, and coming from a generation of lawyers as you do, is this unprecedented? And do you think that is something that should be tackled? And quickly resolved. See, I personally feel the judiciary is not at all to be blamed. I think that if cases had been properly handled at that point of time, 
with proper thinking and if government had been very quick in its response in tackling actions which were wrongful possibly the courts would not have exceeded its uh, normal limits as in the 2g matter and everyone was knowing the entire world was knowing what was happening in the 2g matter everything was openly talked about in the market but we left it just like that and uh, opinions were being given left right and center and uh, tenders were being called for without actually proper procedures and at that point of time possibly i think uh, the government should have put its foot strongly down and uh, should have taken action like uh, what happened even before i think the problem was we sought to i think uh, rely upon this oft quoted mantra of coalition dharma and this coalition dharma has played havoc in the governance of the country and uh, we can't actually be giving importance to the survival of the government rather than the credibility of the government if some partners in the coalition were openly corrupt and bringing disrepute to you action should have been immediately been taken and if as a result of that the government was going to be fall we should have allowed the government to fall since that possibly did not happen the courts had to step in and you see it it has, it has led to a very very sad state of affairs where i think because of the coalition partners even a honest prime minister is being drawn into controversy because possibly no action was taken and uh, even law officers have been brought into controversy a minister is accusing a law officer and uh, lots of uh, uh, bureaucrats are being made as witnesses by cbi entire system has become i think quite topsy turvy in fact that was my next question to you sir we heard the word policy paralysis several times and i want to ask you on two issues one is in terms of decision making you earlier in your opening remarks talked about it that you uh, you you felt that on many occasions uh, there was confusion between even the ministries they didn't know uh, what was going on one was the policy paralysis and the second was a kind of a fear psychosis in some ways which gripped the bureaucracy nobody wanted to put their pen on a file how how did you see this evolve and do you believe that also is something which is a very sad state to be in yeah see bureaucracy i think um, was not accepting itself mainly because what i felt was the coalition partners were given lots of uh, i think weightage and they chose their favored bureaucrats now i can very openly say that in many states actually if you see the police force top ranking police officers are virtually acting at the dictates of the chief minister they are no longer independent likewise i think normally the bureaucrats used to actually be the conscience keeper and put brakes if the government or the ministers went wrong but here possibly many of them were also in connivance with some ministers who were doing this i think wrong things and bringing discredit to the government and significantly if you see it was not necessarily the congress ministers most of them were belonging to the coalition parties and unfortunately the congress remained a mute spectator and took all the blame 
I don't want to name people because it's all too well known. If you see, Congress ministers are a very handful and action was taken. But if at all I think anybody is to be blamed, it were the members of the coalition parties who have all now deserted the Congress. One of the biggest turning points, as far as at least corporate India was concerned, was the entire retrospective amendment. Uh, you had represented the government, won the case in the Bombay High Court. The Supreme Court had a different view. The government went and came out with this retrospective amendment. My sense is that the issue really was not so much about whether that particular company was to be blamed or not, or was in the wrong or not. The outcry was really on the principle that here was a Supreme Court judgment, you went and overturned it by coming out with a retrospective amendment. And since then, and you and I have talked about this at that time, and you told me in my last interview with you that the only way now to rectify is that you make an amendment again. But instead what we've seen is conciliation that goes on. Mediation. Mediation, conciliation, conciliation and now you're back in arbitration. Do you believe, Mr. Parasaran, that again, and I'm not talking on the specific case or the merits of that case, I'm now talking about the perception that it created, the principle of overturning a Supreme Court judgment. Do you believe that that should have never happened? And I, how do you think the new government can correct this? I feel, I think, we unnecessarily, I think, developed a knee-jerk reaction after the Vodafone judgment. And I personally feel the interpretation of Section 9 by the Supreme Court was completely erroneous. Sure. We need not at all have resorted to a retrospective amendment. If you take the 1942 Act and also the 1961 Act, Section 9 of the Indian Income Tax Act seeks to, in fact, bring within its net indirect transfers. And it is actually based on the principle of base erosion and profit shifting. It is already actually sought to be prevented by Section 9. It seeks to actually preserve the interests of the source country. If India is the source, if you have nexus, sure. indirect transfers are taxed. And that was the object behind Section 9. It, it must have been construed widely and it was so construed widely. Therefore, I was saying last time also, instead of going in for a retro amendment, you should have only clarified and redefined the expression transfer. No so, so what can the government do now to close this chapter? See, now the government actually already FDI has stopped coming in. There is always a panic. But now there is a positive sentiment in view of the change in government because of the large mandate given to this government. There is a positive mood amongst foreign investors and this time we should not lose the chance. And uh, the government should immediately take action. What can it do according to you? I feel, I think we should be bold and try to also explain to the people, of course, collection of taxes are important. At the same time, we require, like China, foreign players. And we have to enter into settlements on a fast track basis, enter into arbitrations on a fast track basis, fixing a time slot and settle the disputes through international arbitration comprising of reputed experts and in the meanwhile do away with the retrospective amendment. Either the government can repeal it or allow the courts to decide on that. But that could take years if you leave courts it to the can. courts. I think uh, the courts are ready to hear that. I think the Bombay High Court and the Calcutta High Court. Let the courts decide. If the courts uphold it, well and good. I think if the courts strike it, let the government follow that. 
But quasi disputes intercede between various parties, whether it be it Vodafone or Nokia. I think it should not be allowed to hang on for generations, no? And it's high time we should go on a fast track basis and finish these arbitrations, see, in three months. And the second priority which I feel for this government would be to renegotiate the double taxation avoidance agreements with many foreign countries. Now I understand that many of the companies are shifting their base from Mauritius to Singapore. I was in Mauritius. See, I feel Mauritius is not like Cayman Islands or like any other company in the British BVI or whatever it is. It has also, I think, a structured economy. And today China is eyeing for Mauritius. Other European countries are eyeing for Mauritius because it is a gateway for Africa. And we have lots of opportunities in Africa because the African economy is opening up. And it is also a gateway to Australia as well. It is very actually ideally located and advantages so many languages. 70% of the people are of Indian origin. And therefore, it, it is of a high priority for this government to actually renegotiate that DTAC and actually try to encourage more investments coming from Mauritius. Because that is actually not a tax haven in that sense. If we talk about tax havens, I would call New York is one of the greatest of tax havens. Therefore, I think this government has got lots of things in their hand instead of actually adopting a very conventional approach of appointing committees and commissions and discussing on those reports for years together, they should actually take on hands-on decisions. And uh, it is good that I think the Prime Minister has desired to call neighbors, neighboring leaders for the swearing-in. And we have to compete with China. And we should now actually concentrate on the infrastructure. That will be our greatest of priorities. In fact, on infrastructure, Mr. Parasaran, again, uh, I want to talk to you about a few sectors. So we saw telecom. Uh, that sector was, uh, in fact, you called it uh, almost akin to a fixing in the IPL when you last spoke to me. Uh, we saw a, a, an extremely uh, you know, high on litigation kind of a sector. Almost everyone was suing everyone else, including the government. Uh, post the recent auctions, you know, after which, which were forced by the Supreme Court, but post that one finds the temperatures having come down. come down, right? Now, we saw the similar thing happening in coal, for example. Uh, we've seen something similar in mining, for example. When it comes, or power, for example, the whole pass-through issue is now before tribunals, tomorrow it will wind up before the Supreme Court. Do you, do you believe that somewhere this new government, uh, and it's been done before, at least I know in telecom it has been done before many years ago, where when you found a sector mired in this kind of a controversy, that you just said, okay, fine, for example, in coal, you say, scrap all the auctions, let's do fresh auctions, those who have already spent genuinely money will get it will get adjusted, just like the way it happened in telecom. Do you believe that there is a way out to stop this excessive litigation on some of these issues, which is actually also one of the reasons for holding back? Yeah, I think that, see, matters are not pending in Supreme Court. It will be one of the most easiest solutions for the present government. Now they can take a policy call, inform the Supreme Court, no? this is our decision and put an end to it. Court also, I think, will be most happy to put an end. In fact, court is also thinking a way with regard to coal auctions. Now they are trying to classify different sections of people. People who have invested, who have gone forward, people who have not done anything. You classify them and now go in for fresh auctions. I think that should be a call in respect of the, all the sectors. And uh, now actually they have to be transparent. I think we have learned lessons from the past. And the new government, I think, uh, because of lessons learned from the past, and also in view of the fact that uh, it is actually going to be led by people of experience, I think they should be able to move forward. You, you believe that that is the 
way to go ahead when you ah, find that, certain that, that decisions. That is the way to, because we are badly stuck, I say. Mm. I think if, even if we go to a country like Myanmar, I feel ashamed. See, investments are going to Myanmar, not coming to India. It is going to Thailand, where I think uh, the military has taken over. In spite of actually instability in Thailand, investments are going there. I think people prefer, in spite of actually a lot of uh, local problems, those countries, than India. It's very unfortunate. So unless until I think we come out of our shackles and uh, start being aggressive and take things hands-on, I think uh, we'll go retrograde. We can never improve. One of the uh, big issues, and I know I, you don't like talking about your opinions and neither do I ever ask you, but one of the uh, very important issues that has come up on which you have given an opinion, the matter is before the Delhi High Court. Uh, and I'm asking you about the larger issue at hand here, not the specifics, but about this whole uh, a state anti-corruption bureau going and filing cases against cabinet ministers or uh, against a policy decision, etc. Uh, it's not about just here. Tomorrow you could actually have a situation where any state or any of the police forces there could be uh, engaging in the policy decision. Yes. Is that a big concern according that to That was only my concern. See, I'm not on the merits of the case. If somebody has done wrong, let the CBI investigate. But actually this will set a very wrong precedent. No? Tomorrow, a state government can file a criminal case against another state government's chief minister and a cabinet. Why it's central government? And now, this is actually virtually the concern ACB is under the central government. Now your own actually arm is filing a case against your own other arm. And the counsel for the lieutenant governor attacks the central government. And he was, I think the court was quite unhappy at that. And it was a larger federal question. Correct. That, that's larger the question federal that you were question raising. Yes. As to whether state police can exercise policing powers over a central government. On the contrary, CBI can. Even CBI has got limitations. When it has to go to a state, it has to only can inquire only the permission of the concerned state government, or if the High Court or the Supreme Court issues a mandamus, then it can do an investigation. But if the High Court or the Supreme Court does not interfere, it can't investigate in that state without the state government's concurrence for any offence under the Prevention of Corruption Act or whatever it is. And here they are all central government servants. And the entire cabinet is named in the FIR. And the FIR is given just one day before to the Chief Minister as a direction to register it immediately without a preliminary inquiry. I am not on the merits of the allegations. But things should be done proper. There should be faith in the system. You can't actually subvert it. The Supreme Court is also hearing a PIL. We have also sought for a special investigation team before the Supreme Court. You must also have faith in that institution. I, I want to talk about one more issue, and again the larger issue, not the merit, which is, uh, I think the point you were trying to make in your opinion on the FDI in retail was again the same point, the larger point, that if X government takes a decision, Y government comes and overturns it, that's not really sending out the right message to any investor or perhaps is not even legally tenable. Again, on the larger point. See, there actually I have already given an opinion to the government. What I was pointing out is that, see, this was a very conscious decision taken by the central government in consultation with the state governments who had desired to participate. Secondly, it was discussed in parliament, both houses of parliament. The opposition parties were also parties to it. And both the Houses of Parliament took the views of all the parties, made necessary amendments, and also complied with the Reserve Bank of India's guidelines and the rules 
because of which it was placed before the parliament and it was cleared. There was a PIL file in the Supreme Court and the policy was sought to be attacked. The government defended the policy. And at that point of time, no state government came before the Supreme Court to challenge it. Supreme Court upheld the policy. And this policy itself can survive because the underlying reason for the policy is assumption is there are so, much, so many state governments will participate and the foreign investors also knew, would, have, would have made their calculations. Okay, these are the states where there is scope for this much, I will make this many investments. Suddenly, overnight, merely because there is a change in government, one such state government can't say, we are now actually getting off the bus. It's not a hop-on and hop-off policy. You completely derail the policy. You scrap the policy. Let the central government scrap the policy. But so long as the policy is there, the state governments can't try to destabilize the policy. And it will actually create an imbalance, no? Many people have desired to invest in a particular state, have arranged their affairs. Will the state governments not be bound by the principles of promissory estoppel like other state governments, they give promise to set up industry, and then they wriggle out of the promise? The courts have said, no, you have given a promise that you will give him incentives. Now you can't wriggle out. Therefore, you have given promise to give incentives to the FDI sector through the central government, which is implementing it. But you can have your own Shops and Establishment Act and other laws applicable. But after having given that solemn promise, and the Supreme Court also actually has gone into all that, has seen all the policy and your actions, can you wriggle out of the promise? And I felt that they will be bound by the principles of promissory estoppel. Their actions are likely to be questioned as violative of Article 14 as well. And I have advised the government of India to send a letter rejecting the requests made by the state governments to wriggle out of their policy. It's not a hop-on and hop-off policy. You always stuck to your conviction, Mr. Parasaran, because one of the biggest uh, statements of yours which got a lot of fans for you was when you said, I will not fight the Ram Setu case because I'm a believer in Ram. Uh, I wish you all the very best Thank you. in your future endeavors. Thank you very much Thank for you. talking to us.